come and stand before your maker full of wonder full of fear come behold his power and glory yet with confidence strong near for the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the god who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love morning. Welcome to Oakwood Bible Church. Uh, if you are a visitor with us, uh, take a look in the pew in front of you. We've got some green cards. Fill that out. Set it in the offering plate after the service on your way out. Uh, Passion Week begins this, well, today, Palm Sunday, as we celebrate the triumphal entry. On Thursday, April 1st, we will reflect on the cross through a special Monday, Thursday service at 6 p.m., with a time of prayer and praise. Child care will be available for nursery through second grade, so bring the kids. Then on Sunday, April 4th, we will gather together at 9.30 or 11 o'clock to celebrate the resurrection through a very special Easter service. Child care will be available for nursery through second grade for both the 9.30 and 11 o'clock services. Please be praying for those of you who would like to attend these opportunities. The Awana Grand Prix Workshop will be on Saturday, April 10th from 9 a.m. till noon. Car kits will be available that day for $2. Then on Sunday, April 18th at 5.30, join us for a fun family time with races for Cubbies, Sparks, and Truth and Training Clubbers. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this wonderful day. Uh, even though it is raining, uh, I thank you for that as well as that will bring springtime to us. Lord, thank you for bringing us all together here safely. Uh, bless this time as we sing and we worship you this morning. Amen. Uh, please stand as I do the call to worship. 
Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he. Rejoice with us together as we sing. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The Word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory
There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of thank you. We thank you for your watch care. 
Lord, we thank you for your provision. We thank you for what you've done for us, providing us homes and vehicles and jobs and people who love us even in spite of ourselves. Lord, we praise you for your very presence with us, knowing full well that we're never alone, that you're always here with us. You promise to never leave us or forsake us. Lord, as we look to our world, we recognize that our world is encountering desperate times. When we think of the country of Myanmar, and the atrocities that are taking place in the streets where dozens and dozens of people are being gunned down. Horrible atrocities in Nigeria where people are being taken hostage. Lord, it's just so sad. It just doesn't have to be this way the world will just turn to you. And even in our own country, we think of those in Colorado who are still suffering loss and are grieving the loss of loved ones. Lord, where it just doesn't even seem safe to go to a grocery store. But Lord, we we cry out to you on behalf of our nation and our world. And, And in our hearts, Lord, we cry out, hurry, come Lord Jesus. But Lord, in the meantime, there's work for us to do people to care for, people to love. And Lord, we just ask that you would work even in our midst, in this church, as you would use us to touch hearts and lives, not only here in this place, but in our community. As you do your work in us, as you humble us, as you grow us and mature us to be more like you, trusting you with what you are doing because you are our God and you are doing incredible things. Lord, for those who are wrestling this morning with various issues, Lord, you know it full well as we come to you and we lay our burdens at your feet, whether we're looking at financial issues and concerns or health issues on the horizon. Lord, you know what we're dealing with, relationships that are going the wrong way, broken hearts, Lord, we ask that you would intervene, that you would move, that you would make the difference as we trust in you, as we wait on you for your good pleasure. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you for all that you're doing. And, Lord, we thank you for all that you're going to do as we trust in you, as we walk with you. Thank you for this place where we can still sing your praise and hear your truth. Lord, we ask that you'd move in this place, even this morning, as you superintend over this service. We give it all to you, Lord. We give everything to you, all to you. We owe it all to you, Lord. We pray all this in your son's wonderful and awesome name. Amen. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's a king of Israel. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives 
judges sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! Dr. Lockridge from years gone past, an incredible, incredible oration there. Please take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 21 today for our study. We're taking a little break from our survey through the book of Acts, and as we focus on Passion Week, we uh, look at the triumphal entry this morning, Matthew chapter 21. We'll look at the first 11 verses of this passage and hear Matthew's account of how Jesus came into Jerusalem. Here in verse 1, we read in Matthew 21. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. And most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. May the Lord add his blessing at the hearing and the reading of his word this morning. Well, there are probably some who might remember way back in 1952 when Queen Elizabeth II, the mother of now Prince Charles, was pronounced queen after her father, King George VI, passed away. At the time of her coronation, a year later, there was much pomp, splendor, and pageantry surrounding her installation as queen. Since a king or queen doesn't rule America, we really can't relate to the pageantry and splendor that England goes through when a new king or queen is installed. Usually when a sovereign is crowned, he or she wears the most expensive robes and jewels and would be driven to the capital city in an ornate carriage drawn by beautiful horses. Accompanying the king or queen would be courtiers and foreign dignitaries, and following would be a large entourage of fine soldiers all decked out. There would be also high-ranking religious leaders officiating over the whole affair. Musicians would play, praises would be sung, and prayers made, all coming to a peak when the new sovereign is actually crowned as king or queen. 
Years prior, at the coronation of Queen Victoria in 1838, she wore a crown adorned with giant rubies and sapphires surrounding a 309, that's it, 309 carat diamond. And her scepter was capped with an even larger diamond. It's up on the screen for you to see. Perhaps you've heard of it, the Star of Africa. This is the largest cut diamond in the world. It weighs 530.2 carats. That's a pound and a half's worth of diamond. That's quite a bit of bling, wouldn't you say? However, the reality is that the most significant coronation procession the world has ever seen happened over 2,000 years ago when Jesus of Nazareth entered Jerusalem as the King of Kings. Beloved, we need to understand that this was a procession marked by contrast to what we've seen in the history of the English monarchs. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was an historical true coronation procession of the one true king. But there was no opulence. There was no pomp. There was no splendor. There were no courtiers nor military escort. There were no bands playing or banners waving. Just a lowly Jewish carpenter's son on a donkey. Nonetheless, as we will see today, Jesus is the one true king. He was presented at the proper place, the proper time, with proper preparation and with perfect prediction. He alone is worthy of all of our praise. His path was marked with honor as they spread their garments in his way, as they spread branches before him, and as they enthusiastically gathered around him, and as they openly praised him. And how you respond to the one true king has eternal consequences. Your skeptical indifference won't save you. Your irritated disbelief won't save you either. Only those who believe in him, in Jesus, as their only sovereign Lord, will be saved. He is indeed the king of kings. Today we're focusing on the triumphal entry as we begin Passion Week. Don't forget this Thursday we have a special time of prayer and praise as we take a look at the cross of Christ. And then of course Easter Sunday morning, be thinking and praying about who you might invite to that special service next Sunday. But it is significant to point out that all four gospel accounts record this momentous occasion of Jesus entering into the city of Jerusalem. This morning, we will draw from all four accounts of these Gospels as we consider three incredible truths regarding Jesus, the one true King. But before we study, let's ask God's help. Would you please pray with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this high privilege we have to even spend a moment in your word. Lord, we ask that you would Help us to hear from you today, that you would be our guide, that you would be our teacher. And Lord, help us not to miss anything, knowing full well that there's no one here by accident today, but by your sovereign hand, you've gathered us together for your purposes. Lord, help us not to miss anything you might have for us. We ask that you would be our guide, our teacher, as we look at your word, your truth today. Thank you, Lord, for attending to us. Thank you for your presence with us. We pray all this in your son's wonderful and awesome name. Amen. Well, hopefully you have your sermon notes outlined so you can follow along in our study to see these three truths we're going to look at. The first one is simply this. Jesus is the one true king. He is indeed the one true king. We see, first of all, that he was presented at the proper place. In verse 1 of our account, it says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage to the Mount of Olives. Here we see that he came to Bethphage to prepare for his entrance into the city of Jerusalem. Bethphage was very close to Bethany. Both these little communities were just to the east of Jerusalem. And of course, the capital city of Israel is Jerusalem. Jerusalem, a.k.a. Yerushalayim. Shalom, Shalayim, that's Shalom, that's peace. It's the city of peace by name. So it was extremely proper that the Prince of Peace, Jesus, 
would draw near to the city of peace, thus entering God's holy city, Jerusalem, for his inauguration. Jesus was about to reach the final goal set before him by his heavenly Father. So as the multitude followed along with him to celebrate the Passover, little did they know they were accompanying the Passover lamb himself. Now, you wouldn't inaugurate the President of the United States in Cassopolis, Michigan, would you? Or Decatur, Illinois? Or Walla Walla, Washington? No. Only Washington, D.C. works for that. That makes the most sense. Similarly, Jerusalem was the perfect place for Jesus to come at this time. And speaking of time, he was presented at the proper time. Not only the proper place, but the proper time. In John 12, verse 1, it says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. In John 12, 12, it says, The next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So understand when this is. It's the proper time, six days before the Passover. It was the precise time of year in which Israel celebrated Passover as a nation. Now, Passover was and still is an extremely important memorial service held by every devout Jew every year. Well, what is it? What is Passover? In Exodus 12, we are told that the Passover is a memorial feast to the Lord established so that all Israel would remember God's sovereign deliverance of the Israelites from the hands of the Egyptians. So what is so remarkable about this particular time period, this this particular Passover in which Christ is now entering Jerusalem. Two things. First, because of the historical significance of the Passover lamb. You see, according to Exodus 12, each family, each Jewish family, on the 10th of the month, was to take a lamb for themselves, a lamb for each household. In verse 6 it says, and you shall keep it, that is, you shall keep the lamb in your house with you until the 14th day. Jesus was coming into the household, if you will, the household of Israel, Jerusalem, precisely the same day that a family would receive their sacrificial lamb into their home for Passover. But not only that, there were the crowds the multitudes. At Passover in Jerusalem, hundreds of thousands of Jews would be making their way to the city to celebrate the great feast. The great Jewish historian Josephus records for us that 10 years after Christ's victory over the cross, the number of sacrificial lambs slaughtered at Passover was determined to be about 260,000. You understand that? About 260,000 lambs sacrificed just 10 years after Jesus went to the cross. Now, one lamb was going to be sacrificed for up to 10 people in a household. So the worshipers in Jerusalem that week could have easily numbered well over 2 million people. This would mean that the roads coming into Jerusalem would have been overflowing with people streaming into the city. That the city itself would have been packed with people to see Jesus' entry into the city. It was precisely the right time for Jesus to come. As John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is so true because that's who Jesus is. That's who he is and what he has done. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul says this, For Christ, our Passover Lamb, has been sacrificed. It was the right time, the proper time and the proper place. But not only that, he was presented with proper preparation Verse 1 continues, Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. It says the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. In verse 6, They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. In Mark's gospel, we see a more thorough account of what just happened here. Mark 11.1, 1, we read, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord is need of it and we'll send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt and tie- tied at a door outside in the street and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? 
And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. So it's good to know they're not just stealing animals in the streets, right? They got some permission here. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. The mission was given, this preparation was made, the mission was followed, and the mission was accomplished. Jesus had a divine plan for his entrance into Jerusalem, and these disciples followed Jesus' divine plan to the T. They were obedient, and through their obedience, their mission was accomplished with proper preparation, the proper place, the proper time. And lastly, here on this point, he was presented with perfect prediction. Notice what it says in verse 4 and 5 of our account. It says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. We need to understand that this is prophecy being fulfilled right before us. What prophecy? Prophecy from Zechariah 9.9. This prophecy from Zechariah 9.9 was made 500 years prior to Jesus' arrival. What did Zechariah write? Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Here we are told that the king would come to Zion, that's the highest hill in Jerusalem, and the king would come humble, gentle, meek, and that's contrasted with perhaps a different way a king might come as a, a mighty warrior with his armies. Jesus doesn't come that way. He comes humbly. He comes in a gentle and meek fashion. And the king would come on a colt, we are told, the foal of a beast of burden, as opposed to how some kings might come, coming in on a war horse. Jesus fulfills Zechariah's prophecy precisely. He is the one true king. He came at the proper place, the proper time, with proper preparation, and with perfect prediction. And I'm so sorry for all the P's. Secondly, another P. He alone is worthy of our praise. He alone is worthy of our praise. Here we saw as Jesus comes into this city that his path was marked with honor. How so? Well, first of all, his path was marked with honor as they spread their garments in his way. Don't miss this. Verse 8, it says, most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road. Garments, these outer garments that people wore at the time. Sometimes a robe or a large square piece of cloth. The cloak or outer garment was seen as the most intimate and valuable piece of personal property for most people. In some cases, the poor used the outer garment to serve as their only covering for the night. Now, the whole idea of putting garments on the road before Jesus is very much like the idea of rolling out the red carpet that we speak of today for royalty, foreign dignitaries, and leaders. Now, this custom of laying garments before persons to show honor was an ancient custom. Even in the Old Testament, after Elisha's servant anointed Jehu as king of Israel, Jehu's men placed their garments on the steps for him to walk on. In 2 Kings 9.13, we read, Then in haste, every man of them took his garment and put it under him on the bare steps, and they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu is king. The laying of the cloak symbolized their respect for Jesus and, don't miss it, their submission to his authority. It was as if to say, we place ourselves at your feet, even to walk on if necessary. And I ask you, have you literally set all that you have at the feet of Jesus? Have you given him your spouse, your kids, your bank account, your career, your health, your relationships, your problems, your fears, your life? How have you made Jesus welcome in your life, in your home, in your family? Have you prepared the path of your life for him to tread on? Have you placed yourself in his way to be used by him as he so chooses? His path was marked with honor as they spread their garments in his way. But not only that, 
His path was marked with honor as they spread branches before him. In verse 8, it continues, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. These leafy branches, such as the palm, were used by the Jews to celebrate the festival of booths, where they would celebrate the liberty, victory, and joy of God's deliverance of all Israel out of the bondage of Egypt. The branches were symbolic of salvation and joy as they waved them. For those who are in Christ, there is coming a time when he returns when all of us will have palm branches in hand. In Revelation 7, 9, we read, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, doing what? With palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation bring, belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Why? That's exactly who Jesus is. But how does this relate to us today? If you're in Christ, that is, if you have received Jesus Christ through faith in him as your personal Lord and Savior, and understand that he has purchased your salvation through dying on the cross in your place and on your behalf, rescuing you from the power and control of the evil one, you have much to celebrate. The question this morning is, do you have any joy of praise in the knowledge of your salvation? And if so, in what ways are you demonstrating it? What do you need to wave before him? What do you need to lay down in front of him? His path was marked with honor as they spread branches before him. And thirdly, as the multitudes enthusiastically gathered around him, in verse 9 it says, and the crowds that went before him and that followed, there are people in front of him, there are people behind him. He's surrounded by people. These crowds who went before him. Here they're seeing this rabbi, this teacher who taught with such amazing authority, who had healed the sick, cast out demons, and even raised a man from the dead, <laughs> just not too recently from that situation that took place. And now as he comes into the city, the multitudes are gathered to him to celebrate this king of peace, and they're following after him. Of course, we wonder about all the motivations why people would be following him. Many followed after the Lord, perhaps... There were those who wanted to see Jesus. Perhaps they wanted to keep him inside to see what he was going to do next. There were also those perhaps following a little full of contempt, a little bitterness, a little frustration. He's not exactly what I had in mind for a, a reigning king. There will always be those who are critical of what's going on, even when everybody else is enjoying and everybody's celebrating. There will always be those who are rubbing their hands together going, I don't think I see it. I don't think I get it. Of course, there are some who would be in the crowd who are just going along with the crowd, right? There's so many people there. Everybody else is singing. I'll just go sing with them, right? Of course, there were also likely those who were indifferent to the Savior. And of course, you have the Pharisees who are jeering at him. But we were told that most were praising Jesus as their long-awaited Savior. And I ask you, where are you in the crowd? Do you have your eyes on Jesus, wondering what he's going to do next? Are you following his lead? Or are you indifferent to him? Are you indifferent to how close your Savior is? Fourthly here, his path was marked with honor as they openly praised him. Here we say that in verse 9, they were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They're shouting. In Luke 19.37, in Luke's account, it says, as he was drawing near already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. So I want you to imagine this picture to understand what's going on here. So imagine the city of Jerusalem is right before you and you're looking northward, northward at, the, at the city right in front of you. And to give you an idea of the topography, what we have here, on the right side is a mountain called the Mount of Olives. And you would come down the Mount of Olives, because that's where Jesus was. He would come down the Mount of Olives into the Kidron Valley, then back up into the Temple Mount area where Mount Moriah is. And there would be Zion, the highest mount in the Jerusalem area. And what were they saying? They were crying out, Hosanna. Hosanna. It's a Hebrew word which means save now. 
Hosanna, save now. How many times have you cried out to God that, with that, huh? God, make the difference. Would you save now? Help. But sadly, the crowd that followed that day was not interested in their souls being saved. Near as much as they were interested in their nation being saved. Surely the multitude thought that finally this great teacher is now going to ride into Jerusalem and take over the government and set up his kingdom just as their version of the Messiah should. Finally, he will lead the people in conquering the Roman oppression. But Jesus did not come to conquer Rome, but rather to conquer sin and death. He did not come to make war with Rome, but to make peace with God and for all men. The shouts of the people were accurate, proclaiming Christ as king, and indeed it fulfilled prophecy. But it's likely that the people, many of the people, had no idea of the true significance of what they were doing, much less what Jesus would soon do on the cross on their behalf. Hosanna, save now, they cried, to the son of David. Incredible messianic phrase, this messianic title, the son of David. And the multitudes knew that the Messiah was to be born in the house of David. So in effect, they were proclaiming, save us now, great Messiah, save us now. And they were right in calling Jesus the Messiah, the son of David. But there were many who did not understand who Jesus really was. They were looking for a different kind of king. They were looking for a political king. When it finally occurred to them a few days later that Jesus was not going to immediately deliver them from the hands of the Romans, they turned against Jesus. The people wanted Jesus on their own terms. They wanted Jesus to destroy Rome, not their sins and hypocrisy. Isn't it sad how often we want Jesus on our own terms, right? As long as you satisfy what I expect you to do, Jesus, then I'm all about you. Hey, you're not fulfilling things in my life the way I think you ought to. And we become critical and we push back against him. Hosanna to the son of David. And then they said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This originally was a general statement made during the beginning of the Passover week to all the pilgrims who were making their way to Jerusalem. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it was said of Jesus that he should be blessed. And it is true for all those who come to God through the name of the Lord. Have you put your faith and trust in him? If you put your faith and trust in him, you truly are blessed. Beloved, you cannot count on your own works here we can only count on what Christ has done on our behalf and only what he has done on our behalf will bring any true blessing in your life as you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Literally save now in the heavenly places. Surely the angels were rejoicing on this day, knowing that salvation was going to be made available to all people for all time through the events of that week. And even right now, every time a person gives their life to Christ here on earth, all heaven rejoices with hosannas in the highest. Thirdly, this morning, our response to the one true king has eternal consequences. First off here, your skeptical indifference won't save you. Now, I wasn't there. I don't know exactly how this was said. It says in verse 10, and when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up. So the whole city is in a tumult. The city was moved, rock, shaken. And they were saying, who is this? Well, there's a couple of ways you could say, who is this? You could say, who is this? Or you could say, who is this? Right? I'm not sure. Maybe both were being said in different ways, in different contexts. But it is a logical question, isn't it? Who is this? Who is this Jesus? This is perhaps the most important question for anyone to consider. Who is Jesus, really? From the answer to this question will come the question of what to do with Jesus. But nothing can be done with Jesus until we know with certainty, with accuracy, and with clarity who, in fact, he really is. He is God incarnate. That's who Jesus is. He is God in the flesh. Jesus said amazing things like, I and the Father are one in John 10. He said things like, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. 
Jesus forgave sin. I can't walk up to you and go, I forgive thee. You know, I, I don't have any power to do that. Jesus did. Why? Because he's God in the flesh. That's who he is and that's what he can do. And I ask you, have you answered the question of who Jesus is in your own life? Have you made an informed decision about who this Jesus is? Your skeptical indifference won't save you. Secondly, your irritated disbelief won't save you. In Luke's account, in Luke 19, 39, it says, And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. What's going on? Here are the Pharisees watching what's going on. Everybody cheering Jesus. Hosanna! And they're going, hey, this is over the top. Make this stop, right? We, we can't be, people can't be talking about Jesus being the Messiah. That's messed up in their view. So, hey, Jesus, rebuke your disciples. Make them stop this. A little cancel culture right there, right? That's what's going on. Knock this off. This is over the top. This is inappropriate. We don't like this. Of course, why would the Pharisees say this? Because the Pharisees believed that it was inappropriate for the people to be proclaiming the things they were pro proclaiming. Because in their view, pro proclaiming things like Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and Hosanna in the highest was seen as outright blasphemy. In their mind, there was no way this Jesus guy could be the Messiah. Instead, they were of the opinion that Jesus was merely a misguided man, misguided rabbi of some sort, who was deceiving the multitudes. He was cutting into uh, their financial interests at the temple works. and was certainly not the long-awaited Messiah. In John 12, 19, it says, So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you're, you're gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Do something. We've got to stop him. The Pharisees knew precisely what was at stake here. In their minds, Jesus was nothing more than a troublemaker who had stirred up the people to follow him. But if in reality he really was the Messiah, the Son of God, they would be seen as mistaken or outright wrong about the matter. And Pharisees can never, ever, never, ever be wrong about anything. And because of their pride, they did not and could not recognize who Jesus was, so they refused to acknowledge Jesus as king. Do you understand what's at stake here? If on the one hand, Jesus truly is in reality the Son of God, the Savior of the world, then the only proper response is to come before him and bow your heart before him in praise and thanksgiving for what he has done for you in dying on the cross for all of your sins. If he is truly the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he deserves nothing less than your full faith and trust in him as your Lord and Savior. If, on the other hand, Jesus is not in reality the Son of God and is merely a man who is perhaps maybe a good teacher or merely a second-rate prophet, then the only logical conclusion that can exist is that all of Christianity is a farce. And there really is no forgiveness of sins. There's really no eternal life. There's no hope in this world. So how did Jesus respond in Luke's account after hearing the Pharisees rebuke? Rebuke your disciples. They're over the top, Jesus. Jesus answered in Luke 19.40, I tell you, if these, if these were silent, these people were silent, the very stones would cry out. If, they're not, if they aren't saying it, the whole world is going to scream who I am. Matter of fact, as the scripture says, Paul talks about it in Romans 8. The whole world's waiting, groaning, waiting for the redemption of the sons of men. It's who he is. He said this because of the reality of his kingship over the universe. In other words, if these people will not cry out, proclaiming who I am, the whole creation will cry out. The whole creation will cry out who I am. And I just want to say to you, oh, beloved, let's not be replaced by a rock, <laughs> right? Thirdly and lastly here, only those who believe will be saved. In verse 11, it says, and the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. In John's account, John 12, 42, we read, nevertheless, many, even the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that 
They would not be put out of the synagogue for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Finally, we have those who really understood the reality of who Jesus was. But even they were fearful admitting the truth because to do so would mean to lose respect from their peers. They'd be outcasts from their families. They would risk being thrown out of their meeting places by way of the synagogues. But those who believe will indeed be saved. As Paul and Silas talked to the jailer in Philippi and they said, believe in the Lord Jesus, you will be saved, you and your household. Romans 10, 9 Paul writes, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul goes on to say in Romans 10, 13, for everyone, that is everyone, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, what? Will be saved. And I ask you, have you given your life to him completely? Have you made it clear with God where you stand concerning his Christ, his Savior, this morning? Years ago, I had a dear friend of mine in Wisconsin. I guess I should say he's still a dear friend of mine. just haven't seen him for a long time. His name was Dan. And uh, Dan, as a young man, uh, got into the greenhouse business and was doing really well. He was selling greenhouses all over the country, and actually he was selling them internationally. And as a young man in his mid-30s, he's, he's just making a lot of money. And he's married, and his family's growing, he has several children. And so with all of the proceeds from selling so many greenhouses, he thought, man, I'm, I probably, you know, maybe I should just buy a really nice big house. So in, in uh, Edgerton, Wisconsin, there was this huge mansion, ginormous three-story mansion, and it had been built way back in the day in the 1800s by a tobacco baron of Wisconsin. And uh, so my friend Dan, uh, he bought this mansion. It needed some work. Uh, but on the third floor had a ballroom. I mean, it was an incredible place. It was awesome. And uh, with the work that, you know, he and his wife are going to do, they're going to fix it up, make it even more grand than it already was. They had a big, you know, three stories, a big turret on the one side. It was just with the, the glass on the turret that was, was bowed glass. It was really something. And one day, Dan was out front uh, trimming his hedges, working on his, you know, his property, trying to make it even nicer. And just then, a tour bus came by. Now, this house was so incredible he was on this historic homes tour, and this bus pulls up in front, and all these people start piling out, taking pictures of this incredible mansion. And here's my buddy Dan out there, you know, doing, you know, shearing the hedge and working, and the people, of course, start talking to him. They start asking about, you know, this place, the house, and asking about the owner. I said, well, do you know the owner? Oh, yeah, I know him. <laughs> well, what's he like? Oh, he, he, he's a really wonderful man with an incredible family. <laughs> oh, really? No, his wife is beautiful and he's got wonderful kids. Did he lie? No. Not at all. But he didn't burst these people's bubble, right, in terms of the perceptions. But little did these people know, they, they thought they were talking to the lowly gardener when in reality they were talking to the owner, the one who owned it all. And off they went, and Dan treasured that in his heart. But is it possible that Jesus has been so close? Comes in on a donkey. And yet we overlook him. He's so close, he's right there. He's right there for all of us to know and to receive. if we'd only submit ourselves to the reality and the truths of all that he really is in, rea- in, in all that he is. What was Jesus' admonition? In Luke 19, 40, he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Beloved, don't be replaced by a stone. I've got some illustrations here. Here's, here's one. Don't be replaced by a stone. I just have a few examples here. Just got some more here. Just, just a few. Oh, here's one. 
on there. I think. Right. Here's one. Can't get it. Uh. This is what he's talking about. If we don't say who he is, if we won't proclaim who Jesus is, then my friends here will have to do it for you. May it never be. May it be us. May we be the ones who proclaim all that Jesus is. Jesus is the one true king. He was presented the proper place, the proper time, the proper preparation with perfect prediction. He alone is so worthy of all of our praise. His path was marked with honor as they spread their garments in his way, as they spread branches before him, as they enthusiastically gathered around him, and as they openly praised him. And how you respond to the one true king has eternal consequences. Your skeptical indifference won't save you. Your irritated disbelief, like the Pharisees, won't save you. Only those who believe in him as their only sovereign Lord will be saved. He is indeed the King of Kings. With all the opinions about Jesus in our culture, all the opinions just cannot change the fact that in reality, either Jesus Christ is exactly who Scripture proclaims him to be, the very Son of God, the divine Savior of the world, or in reality, he isn't. Those are the two options. Either he is who he says he is, or he isn't. And one thing is clear, someone is wrong about Jesus. Either he, in fact, is the divine son of God or he isn't. Those are the only two options. Do you recognize him? Do you see the suffering servant? Is he just like a gardener in front of somebody's house? Or do you see him as the sovereign Lord? And will you respond to him? He has washed away your sins through his shed blood for you on the cross. This is who he is, and this is what he's done for you. He longs to forgive you and restore you as you invite him into your life. Would you please stand as we close our service today? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word this morning. Lord, we cry out to you, Hosanna. Save us now. Lord, may, it, may we not be replaced by rocks. May we be the ones who cry out, not only in this place, but in our communities and throughout the whole world, that you indeed are our Savior. You came, born of a virgin, having lived a perfect life, having died in a horrible way in full payment of all of our sin, all of our debt can be removed from us because of your grace and your mercy toward us. The very payment we should have received, you've taken on for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for laying down your your life for us. There's no greater love than this that someone laid down his life for a friend. That's what you've done for each one of us in this room. And Lord, for us, it is uh, to put our faith and trust in that atoning sacrifice. And Lord, it's my prayer this morning that if there's someone here who has never given their life to you, they do so right now. They'd simply say, yes, Lord Jesus, I need you. I need forgiveness. And I cry out to you, save now. Save me from my sin. Forgive me. I invite you to come into my heart and my life. I receive you through faith that you are the living Son of God. Not only did you die for us, but you rose again, conquering the grave once and for all as we celebrate next week. Lord, we thank you for so great a salvation. We thank you, Lord, that it's complete, it's sufficient. You indeed are all that we need. You are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Lord, I pray for those who put their faith and trust in you and for those who might yet be wrestling this morning with that 
reality that they too would come to you and seek your face, inviting you into their life once and for all. Lord, we thank you for all that you've already done for us. And now, Lord, as we are in Christ, for those who believe, we ask that you continue to move in our midst, that you would shape this place by your very presence, and that we would become more and more, more like you, the very people that you'd want us to be in all that which is beautiful and awesome. So Lord, thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this time we would be together. And Lord, thank you for each dear person that's here today hearing these things. Lord, may we not just hear these things today, but may we walk in them, taking your truth with us. You're so worthy of our praise. You are the one true king, the king of kings. We pray all this in your son's wonderful and awesome name this morning. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Peace.